Thank you, Levi, for reading the lesson from Ecclesiastes. You're welcome. <laughs> if we were to think about this man as a contemporary member of the United States, we would say he has control issues. In the sense that here he is, he has made enough money financially not to be one of those people who is entirely captivated by the need to get more. Because you know he has. You know he, he has, in fact, all that he needs and then some. And in fact, he's used his financial security to pursue what we would consider probably, you know, he got a PhD. He searches out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Uh, he would even be called perhaps a Renaissance man because if you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, he has a lot of information about a lot of different subjects, everything from science and astronomy to the ways of the human heart, politics, civic government. He's a person of significant accomplishment, in other words. And yet, and few of those who come to this conclusion, realizing that he is at the stage of life where he, in essence, has accomplished his goals, he's got what he needs. What he faces for the first time, perhaps, in his life <clears throat> is that instead of going toward another goal, trying to take the next hill, he realizes that, well, what have I actually done? Have I, have I made anything approaching a, a lasting contribution? <laughs> no. It, in fact, what will probably happen is, is that all of my money and accomplishments are going to go to my good-for-nothing children. And they'll squander the whole thing. Which means all of my accomplishments, and in fact, are a waste. What a terrible thing to face. No wonder in that bitterness, in that sense of profound emptiness, he says, vanity. In other words, who was this for? It was really for me, and what a mistake I have made. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And in fact, that same character appears in the parable that Jesus tells in the Gospels, where again, a man has incredible financial accomplishment. He has got more than he needs. He's in this context an extraordinarily successful farmer who has put up lots of silos or lots probably of some kind of grain that can stay through the seasons. And he says, to quote, I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Rest, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, enjoy your retirement. It's like the bumper sticker I saw on a car. I'm spending my kids' inheritance, they said. Now, <coughs> In many ways, he is one step behind where the Proverbs story, the man in Ecclesiastes is. Because for him, I've got everything I need so I, in fact, can be happy. I've accomplished what I need. I don't need to take the next hill. I'm really happy with what I've got right now. But in both cases, the word that Jesus would use, and he uses it here, through the voice of God, who says to this man in the parable, you Fool. Now, fool in the Bible is a very strong term. It's not used much. It shows up in the famous verse in the Old Testament. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Fool, in other words, in a Bible's perspective, a fool means someone who operates either without knowing that he is accountable to God or someone who believes that there is in fact no God at all. In other words, I'm the master of my fate, and I can do whatever I want. That's what the Bible describes as a fool. By contrast, that's the kind of person our culture admires. Someone who is full of accomplishments, who knows a lot about a lot of subjects, someone who is financially well off, 
and is happy to do whatever he pleases or she pleases. And yet that is the very character that the Bible calls a fool. In our world, meaning the world of what it means to be a Christian, for anyone to be even remotely considered a fool in the eyes of God, would, it would cause me to shudder. Oh, you mean I'm just doing this all for me? You mean my life has in fact no eternal value? It, it, and no wonder the parable says, what's the contrast? The contrast is to be rich toward who? Toward God. And the invitation, therefore, out of these lessons is to look at our life and in essence say, where are your riches? Or probably more to the point, what do you value and to what do you aspire? How, where do you daydream? What do you think about? Where does, where does your mind go? What is your, to use again contemporary language, what is your happy place? What do you think about? Because if where your brain goes has to do with trying to exert a greater level of control to get what you want. If only so and so would do such and such, then my life would be a heck of a lot better. If only she would realize that what she's doing is wrong and listen to my advice, then I wouldn't be worrying so much. She just, her, whatever, just gets me all the time. Or, you know, I worked really hard and guess what happened to that money? It just, it just seemed to seep through my fingers and what am I going to do now? Control around that does nothing. See what my hands are doing right now? It produces that kind of interior tension. So that as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, for all their days are full of pain, their work is a vexation, even at night their minds do not rest. That's a person with control issues. That's a person who's unhappy. That's a person who continues to worry because they somehow understand that the answer to their life is just the ability to exert more control. And because they can't exert more control, either over their circumstances or over another person, it's like a knot inside. That is the person who is skirting dangerously close to what the Bible describes as a fool. Because what this knot says in your, in your heart of hearts is, it's all up to me. And if I don't do something, it's only going to get worse. And because I can't do anything more than I can, even though I wreck my brain, all of this inner fear, anger, and frustration builds up inside. It's the great prescription for an ulcer. It is usually what happens when people can't sleep at night. Again and again. All of us have sleepless nights. But for there to be a pattern of sleeplessness is probably pointing to something bigger than just, I didn't eat what I should have for dinner that night. And this is what all of this is pointing to. Paul's letter to the Colossians sets a completely different understanding of who we are and where our brains should be going. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It says something different about who we are than what this says. Because you see, if I belong to Christ, a part of what it means to say that I belong to Christ is that I trust Christ. I trust Him. Which means I trust Him to act. I trust Him to be in charge. I trust Him, in fact, to give me a purpose that is far different than the human frustration of trying to control other people and all of my circumstances so that I can get what I want. It's, that is an extraordinarily self-centered existence. And it is that orientation that gives way 
that shows up, in fact, in the very things that Paul writes in Colossians for us to let go of. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language. All of that life, it, it, it is the fruit of somehow trying to get what I want and not being able to do it. And so what comes out of my mouth? I'm critical of other people because I'm frustrated on the inside. I don't always tell the truth because I'm going to look better than I really am. All of You see, all of these symptoms point to a heart that is afraid, angry, and doing its very best to stay in control of its circumstances. Because not to do so would only result in feeling fearful, out of control, and which would be chaos. And I can't allow that to happen. Is that really the alternative? Either try doing my best to master, be in control, and live with all of the anger and frustration because I can't get my way. Or chaos. What does that say? What that says is, guess what? I am Lord of my own universe and it's all up to me. And therefore, if I don't do everything that I should in this situation, and probably more besides, chaos is going to result. And probably a lot of after it's all over. Well, I told you so. You should have listened to me. If you had listened to me, this would not have happened. That's all that we are cautioned against because it points to a heart that does not, in fact, believe that Jesus is Lord. And yet, that's exactly the heartbeat of what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to say, Jesus is Lord, which means I'm not. It's not an excuse for inaction. It's not an invitation to be passive. But it is a call to trust. To believe that God is good. And to make prayer more important in my life than the desire to control. You see, how it even shows up in most of us is when we see something going badly, then our tendency is to want to jump in. It may be that in some of those circumstances, the first thing we should be doing is praying. Doesn't mean we don't jump in. But it may be that prayer is the thing that we do first to guide our actions if we do jump in. Prayer is the thing that begins to change the circumstance in a way that, in fact, we cannot. I think that's what Paul means when he says, set your minds on things that are above. In other words, to set my mind on something that is above, meaning the things of God, in the midst of this situation means I'm trusting God for outcomes that I can't create. I'm believing that God can move into the situation in a way that I can't. I'm willing to take my place and act according to what I believe that God is asking of me. But in the end, I am not the Messiah. I'm only a very small part in God's large, larger plan. So all I can do and should do is to do my part and leave the rest up to God. That's a servant. That's a someone who has yielded the, his or her life to the authority of God and says, God is good. I trust in Him. And I will take my place in what it is that He would have me do. You see, it's not a call to inaction. It's just a call to appropriate action. Meaning, servant-like action. I was meeting with the group earlier in this, before we started the service who are to be confirmed or to be received into this communion. And I pointed out the fact, and you'll notice it, that before they come forward to be prayed for, the word they are called servants. And the thing that they are committing themselves to is service. That's the word that keeps coming up again and again. And it says, because number one, servant is who we are, not master. Jesus is the master and we are not. We're servants. But a servant is someone who is committed to service 
In other words, it's not in action, but it is service. It is giving, it is generosity, it is washing feet, it is stepping in to make a difference, but not in, to make a difference so that I can get what I want, but instead it's stepping in to make a difference so that somehow God might use me. Now it's tricky. It's subtle. And what I mean by that is that I've known people, and I'm sure you have too, who use religious motivations to really as a cover to do whatever they like. Some of the most dangerous language in the entire human existence is, the Lord told me to tell you. That makes me nervous. It can be an excuse to use God to get what I want. That's not the actions of a servant. That's the action of someone who is actually using Christianity to still be the master of their own faith. So we need to God to create a work in us to make us these kinds of servants. Because left to my own devices, I will certainly become the man in Ecclesiastes, the owner whom God calls a fool in the New Testament doing my best to get whatever I want and whatever I need by whatever means possible. We live in a culture that glorifies that kind of self-made, arrogant existence. It's the soup that we live in. Even a lot of our comedy shows on TV are all centered around wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language. When we laugh about it, more often than not, instead of seeing its folly, we're enjoying it. Be careful, sisters and brothers. But then instead, ask God, even as these are coming forward, to say, Lord, help me more and more to be not a master, but a servant. Someone who gives, who's kind, who's generous, who's thoughtful. That somehow what really might happen is not so much me getting my way, but that somehow instead God's will might be done. Because that is in fact the prayer of a servant. May your will be done, O God. Amen.